So 250 voters go to a Madison mayoral debate, and afterwards someone asks, how was it? And the voters say, oh, the debate was great, very informative. But the host, he was kind of hit or isthmus. <laughs> Live from the Central Library in downtown Madison, uh, welcome to our debate. Let's give our candidates a big round of applause. My name is Dylan Brogan, and thank you to our audience here at the Central Library, listeners, listeners tuning in on WORT 89.9 FM, and those watching online and in the future. Mass elects a, a new mayor on April 2nd. We are thrilled to have that person on our stage tonight. The challenger, she's the managing director of the Mayor's Innovation Project at UW-Madison, a former three-term alder from the Eakin Park neighborhood, and the chair of the Oscar Mayer Strategic Assessment Committee. She's hoping to catch the five bus home after this debate, but she'll settle for the two. Please give it up for Satya Rhodes Conway. And now the incumbent, he's a former two-term alder representing the UW-Madison campus. He's an attorney and a former administrator and project manager for Epic Systems. But you probably know him best as the mayor. He served eight non-consecutive terms in the office, including his current stint, which started in 2011. He's Madison's 52nd, 55th, and 58th mayor, and he hails from the Vilas neighborhood. State Senator Fred Ritzer calls him a spring chicken. Please welcome Paul Soglin. <laughs> and our panel tonight, we have WORT News Director Molly Stentz, editor of the Progressive Magazine, Bill Leaders, and editor of Isthmus, Judy Davidoff. Please give Thank you, and thanks everybody for being here. Thanks to the host. This is going to be more fun than I thought. Um, my name is Satya Rhodes Conway, and I'm running for mayor because everyone in Madison should have the opportunity to thrive. I moved here almost 20 years ago, and Madison has given me here has those same opportunities. And that means that we need to work on affordable housing, we need to bring rapid transit to Madison, we need to deal with our racial disparities, and we need to be prepared for the impacts of climate change. I've spent the last 13 years working at UW where I managed the Mayor's Innovation Project, a national learning network for mayors, and I also served for six years on the city council. So I have experience that I can draw on from both here in Madison, but also all around the country. I have a collaborative leadership style, um, and I want to listen to the community here in Madison. I hope to earn your vote tonight. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, you have one minute. Thank you, and, and thank you all for being here tonight. It's been an interesting journey all these years in serving in public office, sharing time and space with the people of the city of Madison, and also being engaged with the leaders of other municipalities throughout the United States. And one of the things that I've seen is that there is a significant difference between simply saying that one is progressive, that one is a visionary, and actually performing. Otherwise, we would not have some of the great troubled inequities within our society. When we look at cities like San Francisco, Oakland, New York, there have been, at least in terms of public policy, some really great mayors. And as in our city, some of those mayors do a better job of implementing and in effecting change. And I should say, it's about more than change. It's the ability to improve. It's the ability to make the human condition better for the residents of a community. And as we've discussed in the past, I've had considerable success in that area, but that isn't to say that there is more to be done, a lot more to be done, and the people of the community who set the values have to be part of the management and the implementation. Thank you. Thank you. 
So ahead of this debate, we polled the public on what they'd ask our two candidates, and that helps shape the questions we'll pose tonight. We have three rounds of questions from our panel and two lightning rounds. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to provide an answer, and the other candidate will have 60 seconds for a response. Our first question is for Mayor Soglin from Molly Stentz. Mr. Mayor, what will you do to create more affordable housing? And I'm not just talking about low-income housing. How are people who make less than $50,000 a year going to afford a house or apartment that doesn't eat up half their paycheck? Well, I would include uh, those who are working and making 50000 a year within that basket of residents of our community that need affordable housing. So let's look back and look at the history of what's going on here. Basically, until I returned to office in 2011, we were stuck at zero. There was virtually no housing being built, whether we're talking affordable or, uh, well, at, at all income levels. Then a couple of things happened, and I just want to make the point that we created two separate programs that had great initiative and led to a goal of 1,000 affordable units in, in uh, five years. And what I read in the papers the other day, it looks like we're actually going to hit 1,300. What we did is we adopted a policy involving TIF monies, which traditionally are only going to be used within the geographic boundary of the TIF district, and then transferred that into a citywide program. The second, and this is something I did, I changed the way the city worked with the private sector in regards to going after the tax credits that come through WIDA, the Federal Housing uh, Affordable Tax Credits. There are several other things we can do. We're looking at double tax exempt bonds and we're looking at new options where we're going to the private sector, we're going to the banks and asking them to understand their responsibility in funding the demand for the 12,000 units we have to correct, that we have to construct within the next decade. We've done some really good things. There's more to be done. Not every city in the country has had that kind of leadership, that kind of vision. And that's 90 seconds, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you have 60 seconds if you'd like to respond. Thanks. It's good to know the kind of leeway we get tonight. Um, I, the mayor's right. There's more to be done. And uh, we need to, I think, broaden our focus to include the preservation of existing affordable housing and uh, rehabilitating that stock to make sure that it's healthy and affordable. And we need to look at different solutions like cooperatives and land trusts uh, for affordable rental and home ownership. Um, and we need to, to actually get to your question, look at the development process and how it may make it harder for uh, folks to create workforce affordable housing for bus drivers and nurses and teachers and you know the folks that live in our community. And uh, one of the things that I think we need to look at is how we're sending mixed signals right now about whether uh, what we want in the development process. And we need to make it easier to be clear about what we want and then to make it easy to produce that without subsidy. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Bill Leaders will have a question for Ms. Rhodes-Conway. What aspects of the state budget presented by Governor Tony Evers do you feel are most deserving of the city's lobbying attention, both because they are important ideas and because they are ideas that could realistically come to pass? And what can the city do to make that happen? Uh, it's really exciting to see something positive out of the state for a change uh, with respect to what's possible here in Madison. Um, and I'm, I'm actually excited about a number of things in the governor's proposed budget um, and uh, equally sort of skeptical about what we're actually going to see come through the process. Um, I think that uh, proposals, all of the proposals that would increase local control are something that I'm interested in. Um, and of course, anything that's going to bring more funding um, to the city of Madison, particularly looking at transit aids. Of course, I'd love the state to give us back the ability to form an RTA, a, a regional transportation authority, so we could use that to fund bus rapid transit. That's going to take the legislature. Um, and it is something that I will be lobbying on. Um, I'll also be lobbying to return control um, over the landlord-tenant interaction. And that's something that was preempted from the city and I think is really detrimental 
um, to us here in Madison. So not in the budget, but I think very high priorities for me in interacting with the state. Um, I'd also like to work actually with the state treasurer's office to see if we can uh, work with her to establish child savings accounts, um, certainly here in Madison, but also statewide. I think that's something that would help get at some of the disparities that we see here in Madison. Mr. Mayor, what would you lobby for now that we have a new governor? You're, you're talking about what is within the budget. Was that the question? Yes, sir. Okay. So there's, there's a number of things we have to keep in mind. Years ago, 30 to 35 percent of the cost of city government came from the property tax. Now it is 75 percent. We've got to recognize that the disproportionate burden, not just in terms of school services, but also in terms of, excuse me, not in terms of just the city, but in terms of school services and county services, we've got to get to more equitable taxation, and we have to, in this case, really support and see that one of the major initiatives in the governor's budgets adopted, not because of city government, because of the well-being of the entire community. And that is the funding authorization he is recommending for the public school system. We've got to see that that is adopted. It is critical in terms of equity. It is critical in terms of the burden on taxes of the people of this community. The second thing I'd like to see us do is see and lobby for the return of eminent domain for sidewalks and bicycles. One of the dumbest things out of all the things that the Walker Associates did in the legislature over the last eight years was take away the right of eminent domain in a period, in an era, where not just uh, those we would call environmentalists, but major corporations are demanding that their communities be walkable. So you can leave it up. You have a question? Mayor. Mayor. Yes. Okay. The top of State Street has been a troubled area. The city has tried cracking down on bad behavior with tickets. The city has tried placemaking efforts with food carts and arts activities for kids, yet problems persist. What are you and the city planning to do next? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is we have to understand the nature of the challenge and the nature of the problem. What we've got in terms of a significant number of the homeless population in our community are individuals with substance abuse and with behavioral health issues. And in fact, in most cases, that is why they are homeless. And that is why they're on the streets. We've discussed this with psychiatrists. And they make the point that for the success of people who are homeless and on the streets, there has to be rules. It's not just for the benefit of the larger community, but for their own well-being. That's the first thing. The second thing is we need greater alignment. We need greater alignment in regards to focusing on getting them into permanent supportive housing not engaged in living on the streets indefinitely, and not engaged in going into transitional housing or shelter, but permanent housing. And the element I think that's missing here has to do with those people who provide the case management. I'm talking specifically in regards to substance abuse and in regards to behavioral health. They are the ones who really are the specialists that we have to partner with in regards to making this transition and getting people into permanent supportive housing. Thank you. You have 60 seconds if you'd like to have a response to that. Yeah, I think that the key is uh, on the prevention side and making sure um, that actually that we are working with the people who already have relationships and have built trust with the folks that are homeless and are, I don't even want to say causing the problem, but are living there. Um, and there are folks in our community that have those relationships and we should be working closely with them um, and doing outreach via them to get people into a housing situation regardless of substance abuse, of mental health issues. I think housing comes first um, and then we need to make sure that people have access to care and treatment in housing as they are ready to accept it um, and that we need to continually be offering that to them. But yes, we need to do anything we can to reach people and get them into a housing and housed situation for their own 
self, safety and health um, in addition for the community. We have another question about transportation here, or I guess our first question about transportation, and it's for Ms. Rhodes-Conway from Molly Stentz. You mentioned regional transit authorities, and under the Walker administration, the state ended those regional transit authorities. Are there creative workarounds that would allow local governments to cooperate on transit systems without support from the state? Uh, yes, and we have to use them. Uh, we have to find, I think, any way we can to create a bus rapid transit system here in the Madison area because we literally can't absorb the number of cars that would come if we don't have that. Um, so Mat Metro already has contracts with Middleton, with Fitchburg, with Verona, now with Sun Prairie, um, and I think we can build on those contracts. I think we can build on our contracts with UW, um, and I'd like to draw the county into the conversation um, because our transit system should be a regional transit system, and we should build it as such. Uh, because people's lives don't stop at the city limit. And so we need a transit system that goes beyond, um, that actually serves people's lives. Um, so yes, we have to form those relationships. I'm looking forward to collaborating with my friends in uh, county government and uh, at UW and in surrounding municipalities. Um, because I think that this is such a critical priority for our community that we have to be working with everybody who's interested. Can everyone see the mayor? This up and down thing, I just want to make sure everyone can see you okay. All right, good. Uh, uh, you have 60 seconds to respond. Thank you. <laughs> so, we, the last time, or two times ago when we debated this, one of the critics said, well, it's very obvious that my opponent is more committed to bus rapid transit than I am. And that's not true. I am more committed. There, I said it. The point is, I am realistic about this. It's going to take hundreds of millions of dollars to make bus rapid transit work. When I first came into office, we got the initial report from the, Medis the Metropolitan Planning Organization to look into bus rapid transit. And then we went ahead and we've been on a seven year timetable and we are successfully on track to do bus rapid transit, but we don't have the money for implementation. We have spending limits on all of our municipal governments that are part of this network. And I see my time is up. This is why we need three, four minutes to talk about these things if we're really serious and in getting into depth about the answers. It's not simple, and you've got to understand we need to know how we're paying for it. Well, let's take at least one more minute. Uh, so who is more committed to implementing bus rapid transit? <laughs> is that a gotcha question? <laughs> uh, look, I, I don't want to argue about who's more committed, um, but I will say that I've been a bus commuter the entire 20 years that I've lived in Madison. So I ride the bus every day, um, and I know that I am lucky to be able to do that because of where I bought my house and where I work. And the system does not work for people um, who need to go the opposite direction from me, need to go out of town instead of into uh, downtown or campus. Um, and it doesn't work for people who work second and third shift. And uh, you know, over the years, even when I was on the city council, I mean, the first city committee that I ever served on was a metro planning committee. Um, and I see very few people in public office who actually take the bus and know what a transit system needs to do for people who rely on it. Uh, so it, am I more committed? Well, I'm committed because it's my method of transit, right? It's, I use it every day, and I know how important it is to people's lives. Mr. Mayor, about 30 seconds. The other day, we were, I'm going to not go there. Okay. Um, what I, I want to point out is you know we've got spending and levy limits here in the city of Madison. We cannot, along with our neighbors, do more than make small incremental changes if we are going to work off the existing tax base. Even if we were to gut snow plowing, a portion of the police and fire department budgets, park maintenance, we would not get near the revenue source we need to make bus rapid transit work. 
That said, I want to renew what I said earlier. We are still on track, on time, and I am just a firm believer that with my leadership, we will get the state then to give us the new financing authorization that we need that comes with a regional transit uh, authority. And that's how it's worked elsewhere in the country. We need that to raise the hundreds of thousands of dollars to build the system, buy the all-electric buses, and to build that very romantic part, which everybody loves, the garage with the solar heating panels, as well as solar electric. All right, we'll keep you standing there because your next question is from Bill. Mr. Mayor, you have pointedly rejected the contention that Madison is a racist city. Please elaborate on why you reject that label and, and tell us whether you think the people who apply it are exaggerating. Well, I do think it's an exaggeration. I look around this room and I'm having a real hard time identifying somebody who is a racist. I, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Well, uh, is Madison a racist city, and is that an exaggeration? So I was trying to, to make a point that I don't see a racist person in this room now that the neo-Nazi left about 15 minutes ago, and he was here. But my point is, when you look at what the city's values are, when you look at the commitment that so many people and so many institutions have made in regards to racial equity, social justice, making changes in the criminal justice system. I do not believe that this is a city that is racist. Do we have racial inequities? Yes. Are there parts of systems that produce racial inequity and perpetuate it? Yes. But there are solutions, and we're working on them. We're making change. If you want to get a TIF financing program, you've got to now do a jobs TIF, and you've got to do not just hiring people at $15 an hour and all the other requirements, but you've got to help work on getting people from the census track, the low income census track in your area, employed in your company. And that's just one example. Ms. Rose Conway. I don't think you should ask two white people whether Madison is racist or not. Is that your answer? I, the only thing I would add is that I think you have to have an understanding of the breadth of racism. Saying that Madison is a racist city isn't saying that everybody who lives here is a racist or acts racist on a regular basis. It's saying that there are historical and structural and institutional problems with racism in our community. And we have to be able to name the problem and understand it if we're going to work on it. Yeah, now, is, would that apply to any city in America? Absolutely, and to our state, and to our nation, and to many other nations. Judy, we have uh, a question for Ms. Rhodes Conway next. Right. Some city agencies employ public information officers who control media access to frontline employees. Some agency directors also control access. How much freedom would you give city employees to speak to the media? about their own areas of expertise. You know, I was just having a conversation before we came here about the fact that we don't have a sort of unified communication strategy in the city and that that might be a lack. Um, I favor transparency. Um, I don't think the city should have anything to hide um, and I've never understood why mayors um, have made it hard not just for the media um, and regular folks to access city staff, but even sometimes for the council to do so. Um, so I would be more inclined to let uh, there be greater access by, by everybody. Um, and in fact, one of the things I'm really interested in pursuing is some sort of office of community engagement that would promote that kind of access um, with the city as a whole, but then also with individual departments and frontline staff as necessary. Mayor Soglin? When I returned to office in 2011, I changed the city policy in regards to media access. And it basically came down to this simple requirement. Anyone 
is free to answer any questions of the media. Anyone is free to talk to the press. We only ask one thing of you, which is you know what you're talking about. But there are no uh, constraints other than an occasion uh, when we've got, a, for example, we may be involved in litigation and the attorneys would like uh, most uh, city employees, particularly those not involved in the litigation, uh, to refrain from saying anything. In terms of the public information officers, what we're trying to really accomplish is obviously in this day of social media, getting more and more information out to the public, to get it out there particularly as we are going through a period of open data and getting all the data that we can available to the public. So if a head of an apartment wishes their employees not speak to the media, is that something that occurs in city government now? Or? Oh, if, uh, I know just a division head or an uh, agency head, if they uh, prohibit their employees from speaking to the media, is, I mean, is that, the, is that the case in some departments? That may occur if you've got, for example, an individual who has repeatedly uh, not been factual or accurate. All right. Well, that brings us to our first round, uh, our first lightning round, that is, and this will be interesting. Uh, it's actually going to be a round of Madison trivia. So we didn't tell the candidates this was happening in advance, so thank you for being good sports, and the winner will become the next mayor. <laughs> so you have these pieces of paper in front of you. Uh, I'll give you about 10 seconds, just write them down, and then uh, show the audience, and then we'll just see how it goes, and I'll read them aloud for our radio audience. All right, so if nobody gets it right, uh, I'll ask the audience, but then uh, let's keep our guesses to ourselves until then. So the first question, who was Madison's first mayor? I have no idea. All right, well, it's not Emily Dixon, Dickinson. Uh, it was uh, Jarrah's fair child in the street behind us is named after him. How about which Mass and Alder said in 1988, what leaders do not respond aggressive? Hold on, sorry. When, when, when. Thank you guys. <laughs> which Mass and Alder said in 1988, when leaders do not respond aggressively to racism, it is because they are limited by their racist tradition. Now you gotta build an advantage because you were around then, Mr. Mayor, so. Anyone? Didn't live here yet. <laughs> All right, do you, anyone have a guess? Gene Parks is correct. Uh, that is true. All right, that, all right, we'll give you that one. It's, what former Madison Alder? This is not going very well. All right, on to the next question. Uh, when did, what did Judge James Doty bribe legislators with to help persuade them to make Madison the capital of the Wisconsin Territory? Sand. The isthmus. Wetlands. He actually bribed them with buffalo robes. <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> I'm not sure you it was buffalo, and other things. It was buffalo robes and the hundreds of acres of land around the capital. All right, we'll give it to you. It we'll give you that one, because that is indeed correct. <laughs> okay, how the many wetlands. cities the number border Madison? This is just a number. Cities, not towns. Not towns, cities. We got them on this one. They're really participating. Okay. Five. You're going five? Not villages? We're, no, just cities. Three. It's actually four. <laughs> so uh, we have Fitchburg, Middleton, Monona, Sun Prairie. The city of Verona comes real oh, close. But, the, yeah, the town of Verona is around it, and the only other city in Dane County is Stoughton. I do not recognize Fitchburg as a city. <laughs> <laughs> then you would be correct, sir. Good. Um, all right, this is a good one. Uh, I'll give him that one. <laughs> who, so who was or is the longest continuously serving Madison mayor? Who was or is the longest continuously serving Madison mayor. The Hound. He wrote those all ahead of time. So you have a guess, you're going with- I'm pointing at him. It's actually not Mayor Soglin, it is uh, Mayor James Law, who served from 1932 to 1943, nine years. 
But if the mayor is reelected, he, he very well could break that record. So, All right, this is my favorite one. What's the catchphrase of the comedian who filmed the movie Back to School, a comedy that came out in 1986? What is the catchphrase of the comedian who was in Back to School, which was filmed right here in Madison? I feel like these questions are skewed towards baby boomers. Well, um, I wasn't alive when the movie was made, and I knew the answer, so. I know that he oftentimes... And, and against policy wants. <laughs> Do you have a guess, Mr. Well, he oftentimes used the word the jerk. Uh, it was Ronnie Dangerfield and his I don't get any respect. <laughs> there you go. All right, that brings us to the end of our trivia. Let's give him a round of applause just for playing along. Our second round starts with a question from Molly Stentz for Mayor Sagan. So let's talk about sprawl. If keeping people here in the city is more efficient and it's better for our tax base, how do we encourage residents to live in the city as opposed to surrounding communities? And what leverage do we have to prevent large employers from leaving the city? Well, we've been through this a number of times with large employers, I'll start with that. And what we have to do is try and create an environment in which they think that it is wise to be located in the city. Sometimes that may involve a TIF, but we refuse, and I refuse, to get into a competitive bidding war with, for example, Middleton, as was the case on Spectrum Brands. It was unfortunate that Spectrum left the city of Madison, but we're not going there. We're not going to the lowest common denominator, which is Foxconn. I think one of the most effective things that we can do is to point out to people the value of city life and the value of living here. And one of the objects of that is transportation and transportation costs. It's not just the question of whether or not that starter home costs $180,000 in Sun Prairie and $220,000 in Madison. It's now going to be all of the associated costs in terms of commuting, in terms of other prices that one encounters in, in daily life, and in terms of, of the environment. That is what is really driving city policy in regards to land use and trying to make walkable neighborhoods and trying to make sure there's access to schools, access to shoppings, and walkability to jobs. Ms. Rhodes Conway, you have 60 seconds. I, I think it's about quality of life and um, talent retention. And so a, a few things about each of those. Um, it, we have incredible quality of life in downtown Madison and in our neighborhoods, and we need to make sure that we're building on that. Um, we need to be creating more um, neighbor, walkable neighborhood business districts like Willie Street, like Monroe Street. Um, those are almost overloved. Um, so where are the next ones, right? And, and where are the places that people uh, then want to come and live? Um, and how do we create context sensitive density so people can't afford to live there? So affordability is definitely part of it on talent ret uh, retention. Um, but I, I also want to say that I think it's important um, what I hear from African American professionals is that they don't have the services or uh, the entertainment options that they want to live here. And I think that national and international corporations know that they need that to be able to keep talent. So that's something the city has to work on. We have another question for Ms. Rhodes Conway from Bill Leaders. <clears throat> you have said that while it would be great to have a public market Providing affordable housing and bus rapid transit should be higher priorities. As mayor, would you be prepared to let the idea of a public market go unrealized as you, as you focus on these other goals? It depends. Um, I love the idea of a public market. I think it would be a great asset to Madison, um, but I'm concerned about how many iterations we've already gone through and how much money we've already spent um, in the process. And I'm concerned about whether or not it will be able to sustain itself in the long term financially. Um, so it depends on what I see 
in terms of the business plan and the budgeting um, and whether or not the market can sustain itself in the long term. I'm not prepared to abandon it right now. I know that the folks on the market foundation are working really hard to raise money and to put together those plans. Um, I think the market ready program has been an unqualified success and I give the mayor credit for that. Um, so I'm not ready to say no, stop, um, but I, I'm sort of cautiously hopeful that they'll be able to pull it together and that we will have that. But if it comes down to it, yes, basic needs like affordable housing and transit, I think are more important. I guess this is where a vision of a city really differs between the two of us. When the public market went through its first reiteration, it was going to be down here, downtown. It was going to be oriented towards downtown business people, and it was going to be oriented towards tourists. The public market that I saw, and having visited over 15 public markets, actually 16, here in the U.S., is a public market that principally sells fresh foods that have dirt on it. Real food for real people that provides nutrition and accessibility to healthy, great food. But the other part of this public market is the fact that this public market is going to provide opportunities for 60 vendors, two-thirds of whom have gone through the program and are qualified are from communities of color and are women. That's the key to the public market. It's also an entrepreneurial venture for people to start businesses and become economically independent. And $4 million of public money is nothing compared to $200 million for bus rapid transit or the five or seven million dollars we may put in any year into affordable housing. Ms. Morales Conway, you mentioned the market ready program that is the idea, right, is to get those vendors in the public market. Can that happen without, without it? Uh, sure, I mean obviously they're expecting to be in the market and that's what they're prepared for, but uh, they, many of, some of them have already gone on to start businesses somewhere else. It, they've been waiting a long time. <laughs> Uh, uh, and some of them have been then ready for market and are now going on to other things. And so, I, yeah, I think could we find them other places to be? Some of them for sure, and some of them already are. All right, our, our next question is for Mayor Soglin, and it's from Judy. Has the city engaged in any efforts to bring high-speed passenger rail to Madison since 2011 when Governor Walker rejected federal funds for the project? Do you consider it a priority? And if so, what is being done to make it a reality? That's, that's a really curious question, and I don't mean to avoid it, but let's be serious. A city is not going to develop high-speed rail. There's a reason I don't think the question was that the city was going to develop it, just if there's any um, the, and relationships. Uh, yes, okay. there is. In fact, we continue to renew each year our membership in the high-speed rail uh, organization based in Chicago. There was one conference here in Madison a couple years ago uh, as they rotate their meetings, which I addressed. And yes, we are committed. We are in contact, obviously, with Milwaukee. And we really want to see a high-speed rail system that serves from Chicago through Milwaukee and Madison up to the Twin Cities. Yes, we continue to be engaged, and we're not following the Walker administration and, and letting this languish and die. You have 60 seconds if you'd like to respond. I mean, at this point, I'd settle for a medium speed rail, right? <laughs> Anything. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, we, we need to improve transportation between Madison and Milwaukee. We need to have, I think, a closer relationship. The two biggest cities in the state should be working together um, on any number of things and learning from each other. And that can, and not just city government, I don't, I mean, I mean all of us, right? And that happens better when it's easier to get back and forth. So absent rail, um, let's focus on the bus systems that already exist and how can we make it easier for people to use those. We've talked in other forums about a bus terminal and whether that could be possible someday in Madison's future. It would be a huge improvement. Molly, you have a question for Ms. Rose Conway. Yes. So Madison often has some of the highest voter turnout across the state, yet often in local, many people are not voting in local elections. Do you see that as a problem? And if so, what should we do about it? Yeah, I mean, 
I'd love to see everybody vote in every election. Um, and I think that I give uh, the city clerk a tremendous amount of credit for the work that she has done to make it easier for folks to vote here in all of Madison's election. In fact, uh, I know at least one person in this room voted on their way into this debate. Um, you could uh, still go if you wanted to and vote right now. Um, and that's thanks to the work that the clerk's office has done. Um, it, you know, folks have talked about whether we should move our local elections to the fall. Um, I think it's an interesting idea. Um, obviously, that's a statewide change, not a city level change. Um, other cities have uh, allowed um, folks that are 16 and up to vote in municipal elections. Um, there's, there's a lot of interesting things going on around the country that expands the franchise and encourages voter engagement. Um, I'm interested in anything that encourages voter engagement. Well, let's give a round of applause to the person who came here after they voted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, uh, what about low turnout in local elections? Well, a couple of things. First, I'd like to just give some credit to the city council and to a certain degree myself for having added additional funding so that the clerk could hire more people, particularly so we could get these extended periods of absentee balloting, which helps turn out the vote here in Madison and disproportionately gives us more influence in the rest of the state, which of course we know the Republicans in the legislature tried to thwart. A uh, couple of things. Uh, first, let's understand that there's a reason the progressives, and I'm not saying this is good or bad, but we should understand why the progressives decided to have the voting sequences here in Wisconsin that we, we now have. They wanted to make sure that national partisan uh, trends did not influence local elections. That's why local elections are nonpartisan, and that's why they're in the spring. I don't know which is better, to increase the vote, uh, or to move us to the fall. All right, Bill, you have a question for the mayor. During the debate for the Democratic primary for governor, right here in this very room, I ask you a question about your temperament. Like when you called Madison all the persons who did something you didn't like, traitorous. You had a really good answer, so I'm gonna pose that question again. Why are you sometimes so acerbic? Why do you sometimes say things that alienate potential allies? Well, I'm not sure they were potential allies. <laughs> um, I made a commitment and a decision early on in, in, in my political career that when it came time to making a choice between the people that I serve and other politicians, I was not going to abandon the people. There is a trend among politicians that there's a socialization process, and you are expected not to do anything to disrupt relationships. You're supposed to be you know, a really uh, quiet person when it comes time to, to dealing with these kinds of issues. I am not going to abandon the people who elected me. When somebody in public office who's running a lousy operation hides behind a statement that we are one of six communities that have won this award, and it turns out that the award was a fraud where the company that sold the gear uh, gave it to the six companies they sold it to. I'm sorry, that is unacceptable. And I am not going to abandon the people who elected me. I am going to say, not necessarily when the emperor, but when that particular city council member or somebody from county government or the state government isn't wearing any clothes, they're naked. So you have 60 seconds. I'd be, I'd, I'm not sure which part you want to respond to there, but. M me neither. Uh, it, look, it, we can disagree without being disagreeable. And I see everyone as a potential ally. Um, we don't have to like people to work with them. And I didn't on the city council like everyone that I worked with, nor did I agree with them all of the time. But I was always committed to having a working relationship because the point is to serve the people of the city. And if you let personality or relationships or lack of relationships get in the way of that, then you're not serving the people of the city very well. 
So I think it's very important to be able to work with as broad a range of people as possible um, and to not let anything personal get in the way of that. Mr. Mayor, since this is directly about you, would you like to say anything else on this matter? I'm sorry, I cannot be a close friend with Scott Walker, and I can't be a close friend with somebody who claims to be a progressive who's screwing the people. And what about County Executive Joe Parisi? He's certainly a progressive. Well, why don't we, all right. And who's talking about being friends? Let's, let's, let's talk about what's going on in the jurisdictional transfer. The county increased your wheel tax, a, repress, a regressive fee, $28 to use it to fund county highways. There's hardly any miles of county highway in the city of Madison. And yet with all that additional money and with our paying a great disproportional share of county highways, we're being told at this point that the county is not going to, to approve the construction of either Buckeye Road or Cottage Grove Road unless we capitulate. And if you read today's paper, you'll know that we're not alone. Virtually every city and village in the county is counting on us. They're looking to Madison and they're saying, don't capitulate, don't give in. But yet then how are they casting us? They're saying that we're the ones who are holding up the safety uh, improvement. We're the ones who are going to make the children walk through mud. And, and we're the ones who are going to be uh, responsible for the failure to build the highway. We have funded it. All we're asking, and this goes back for generations, that we be considered part of Dane County. We are part of Dane County, just as the town of Primrose, just as Maple Bluff, just as DeForest. Why is there this business that Madison should go 50-50 with the county? We're already in for 50. We're half the county. And this is a principle that if you want funds to be used for community services, you know what the county told us? They said, Impose your own wheel tax and use that to pay this bill. Well, if I were to impose a wheel tax, which I'm not really favorable to, I'd use it to pay for buses. All right. Well, you, you have about two minutes there to uh, talk about Buckeye Road. I don't need two minutes to talk about Buckeye Road. Um, I mean, we're paying that wheel tax, right? Yes, we are. And uh, it's probably a good thing. Um, I just want to go back to the, the point that we don't have to be best friends to work together on something, right? We don't even have to agree to work together on something. But we do have to have a working relationship with the county, yes, especially with the county. We have to have a working relationship with the school district, with surrounding municipalities, with the business community, with you. Because, because we have to all be working together to move this community forward. And we can't let things get in the way of that. Even when we do disagree vehemently on something, we have to be able to turn around and work together on something else. And I think that gets to your question. Judy, you have quite a question for Ms. Rhodes Conway coming up like after it's this. A yes. Bit, a little bit similar, but um, yes. Yeah, so you have called Mayor Soglin a mentor. Um, what's the most valuable thing you have learned from him? And what have you observed that you would not emulate? <laughs> Maybe that first one. <laughs> I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the first, and I think I already answered the second. Um, no, I, in all seriousness, Mayor Soglin loves this city and has served it honorably for a long time. And that is worth recognizing. And so one thing that I have learned from him and for, from many others who represent our city is that depth of commitment to public service. And that's what inspires me. Um, and that's what I hope to bring to the office as well. Um, I think the contrasts um, are obvious. Um, and I think there's many things that I would do differently in office. Mayor Soglin. 
what's the most valuable thing you've learned from yourself? No, I think uh, <laughs> we, we throw it around. What's the most valuable thing you've learned from Miss Rose Conway? That when it came time to negotiate a very, very difficult situation uh, in regards to the future of Overture, that she was able to find the best solution and to work with the city council to get it affected. And despite the fact that it pained me dear, dearly to see the city lose control of Overture, which I'd always hoped that a civic center in this community would be under the control of the city, specifically so that we could have greater public access. It was the right thing to do because the burden financially on the city would have stopped us from doing so many good works in terms of community service and dealing with the challenges of, of poverty and inequity. All right, that's the uh, end of our second round. Let's give them a big round of applause for all those great answers. So we're not going to have you write anything down, but hopefully these will be a little shorter. Um, why don't we start with the mayor on this one? Uh, you're on a you're on a stranded on a desert island. Which former or current alder would you want to be stuck with, and why? <laughs> Bill Drees. Why Bill Drees? Because he had a sense of humor. When we endorsed the great boycott and the lettuce boycott, he uh, held up a sign in the middle of the testimony that said, eat grapes. <laughs> so despite his being disagreeable, he was a good companion. Ms. Rose Conway? I have a lot of great colleagues on um, the council. Um, I could choose Alder Revere, who's here in the back, uh, because he could just talk enough to blow a wind and get us off the desert island. <laughs> I love you, Mike. <laughs> I would definitely not choose the former Alder from the 13th. Um, I think I would choose somebody who I didn't serve with, uh, Alder Denise DeMarb, because she and I have um, become really close friends. When she got elected, I offered to... Um, just give her advice over coffee one day, and that turned into six years of monthly coffees. And we we still meet every month. So while you have you there, so if you were governor for a day and could propose one policy change, what would it be? Only one? Just just one. God, I'd, I'd repeal Act 10 and bring back collective bargaining. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, same question. I would open up the prisons and release tens of thousands of people who don't deserve to be there. All right, so uh, if I gave you a glass of water from Well 15, which people on the east side have been drinking before it was shut down this month due to potential contamination, would you drink it, yes or no? I, I would because I'm not going to have any kids. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor? I would drink it because we have the documentation that the PFABs in the, in the water that come through that well nowhere near come near the, uh, the uh, safety levels where you get concerned. All right, well, why don't we move on to our, our third round of questions here. Uh, thank you very much for... I got dark quickly. Yeah, it, hey, <laughs> I had more short answers, but I feel like that's a good one to end with. So, Molly, you have our first question for the final round. Also about water. Yes, and it's for, Ms., it's for Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor. So, given that the flooding we saw last summer was predicted, what specific steps should the city be taking to prevent similar or even more catastrophic flooding? Did you say single step? Specific. Oh, specific. specific. Well, probably the most important steps, probably the most important steps the city can't take. And that is a lot of the problem, a lot of the problem, most of the problem that affects the isthmus and the areas around Monona and Brittingham Bay have to do with the congestion downstream. 
So first steps, even though can't do it, dredging, greater weed harvesting, dealing with the uh, impediment of the rail trestle, which acts as a dam, and that's, that's, that's where I would start uh, in terms of that part of the flooding. In terms of the independent act of flooding which happened on the west side, there, uh, there's a number of engineering things we are doing, and we are correcting some mistakes that were made. For example, a culvert on one part off of Midvale Boulevard near the bike path was designed too small, and we have to go in there and we're going to change that. And then there's some other engineering changes we're making in the McKenna uh, Boulevard Gammon Road area. And there's a critical decision that has to be made by Shortwood, and that is whether or not they would approve building a outlet that would go under the golf course. You have 60 seconds to, uh, about what specific steps should the city be taking to prevent similar catastrophic flooding to what we saw last summer? Uh, to specifically to work with the county to make sure that the lake levels stay lower and yes that includes the downstream clearance but it also includes the management levels um, but more importantly right now the way that we think about stormwater is it falls the rain falls and we try and move it away as quickly as possible and what we need to do is we need to try and capture and infiltrate or hold the rain where it falls for as long as possible. Um, and that means that we have to use a whole, a whole different set of technologies. And this is something that cities all around the country are doing with great success. Um, Cambridge, Massachusetts has reduced flooding, um, has good modeling on this. Philadelphia has done incredible work. Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Seattle, Washington. There's a lot of places that are using green infrastructure to control stormwater. It won't stop a flood like the one we saw, but it will make it better, and it will make the smaller storms better as well. Our next question is for Bill, for uh, Ms. Rhodes Conway. There has been a great deal of justifiable public concern about the fatal shootings by Madison police of unarmed persons do you think there needs to be greater oversight and or changes in police policy? Is the current standard for the use of deadly force too loose? Yes, there needs to be greater oversight. Absolutely. Um, I now have read the OIR report that was commissioned a couple of times. Um, I think there's a lot of really good information in there, um, including, and I know that that the department is working on this already, but including um, recommendations around use of force, including recommendations about community accountability um, and accountability at the very top levels, performance evaluation at the very top levels of the department. Um, I, as mayor, I would work to make sure that we're implementing those recommendations. The task force on police policy and procedure is also working on their report now. Um, I'm not ready to say that I agree with everything in it because I haven't read it yet. It's not finished. Um, but I know that that group has been doing incredibly thorough and detailed work, and I'm really interested in what they have to say um, because I think there'll be a lot of good information in there, and I look forward to working with them to be able to implement uh, many, of, if not all, of their recommendations. I think we have a lot of work to do here. There is a huge trust gap. I talked to a woman today who said, that her college-age white daughter is afraid of the police because of what's happened in this community. Um, and that means we have a ton of work to do, right, if even somebody that privileged is afraid. Mr. Mayor. The uh, delays in, in terms of responding to the study uh, are unfortunate, but the department has gone ahead and has made some changes in reviewing its standards in regards to the use of force, but particularly paying attention to the training aspect of it, because regardless of what the standards are, if there aren't changes in training, it's not going to do much good. So uh, we'll probably get further into this when the rest of the recommendations on the report come out, but I'm pleased to say that some work on this is already being done. 
I believe that the issue of trust is also a really significant part of it. I know that there's a number of people in this room who over the years have attended the mayor's annual neighborhood conference that we hold in the fall. That conference is focused on things like transportation, land use planning, certain other issues related to that. If I'm reelected, I can tell you that the next such conference is going to be on public safety, public safety and health, and we'll extensively go into this subject with all the neighborhood groups. Thank you. We just need to pause for one second to, well, I will not really pause. You're listening to WRT 89.9 FM in Madison. Judy, we gotta do a legal ID because we're on the radio, so there you go. Judy, you have a question for the mayor. Yes. The conversation about wide academic gaps between students of color and white students in the Madison School District has been going on for quite a while. We know that some of these disparities exist when children enter kindergarten or first grade. Is there something more the city could be doing to better prepare preschool children for K through 12? Academic performance is tied to a number of variables, including household income, including um, uh, health and health planning, particularly uh, in the early infant years. The city collaborate as closely as we can with the Madison School District in providing a safe and healthy environment within the neighborhood. I am really proud of one of the things that's happened, which is the uh, Northside Early Childhood the uh, development program. This is something that came about after I met with a group of philanthropic organizations and said, you've got to change your focus. It's more than just doing charitable work. And youth, children and youth, is has got to be an emphasis with really an investment in the future. We are collaborating, it's a city county uh, project through the health department. And we're working with them, and I'm hoping this is going to be a model that can, we can roll out throughout the city of Madison. The health aspect of this is critical. We saw a significant increase in the number of insured households after the adoption of the Affordable Care Act. But there's still about 15,000 people in Dane County, most of whom are in the city of Madison, that do not have health coverage. And one of the things that we're going to hopefully roll out this summer is going to be a plan to use peer support to get more families engaged in family enhancement, getting into parenting, and access for uh, both um, uh, mothers who, who are pregnant and, and for, for infants. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. You have 60 seconds to respond. It, I, it starts with making sure that kids are ready to learn. Um, and to do that, they have to be fed, and they have to have access to healthy food, they need to have a stable housing situation. You know, we have kids that have to move from school to school because they don't have a place to live. Um, and there's no way you can learn in that circumstance. Um, they need to have stable and safe transportation. I mean, it, this is what I'm talking about. Affordable housing, a strong transit system, right, and things that support family success across the board. Um, and we need to do that in a way that is trauma-informed, right? Because it is traumatic for kids to grow up in these circumstances, and so we have to be thinking about how do we deal with that. Um, and ultimately, we need to make sure that we're supporting the entire family to promote readiness to learn. Um, and that some of that looks like supporting parents, and are they employed? And uh, do they have the transportation they need? Do they have childcare for younger children? Do they have, I mean, the, just on down the list of the day-to-day -day needs of families um, that will set you up for success. And I think that the city does a lot. There are a lot of resources in this community. We probably need to be better coordinated and we need to fill in the gaps. Thank you, our next question is from Molly, right? For Ms. Rhodes Conway. So Madison's Sustainability Committee is recommending a new comprehensive plan to take what they call bold climate action. It commits the city to becoming carbon neutral and to using 100% renewable energy by 2030. What do you believe is most crucial, the most crucial part in achieving this goal? 
I'm so glad that we actually have a plan that has some details to it. I worked on Madison's sustainability plan when I was on the council and it was one of the more frustrating experiences of my life because I couldn't get uh, us to choose some priorities um, and to put metrics on them. Um, I, I, we have to do this, right? We have to take climate seriously. We have a decade. So the city has to do everything it can and um, what's most important, what's most important is reducing our emissions. Right? And I actually think that, this, that city government has done a tremendous amount to do that already. What I would like to focus on is how do we push that out into the community and how do we make it easier for folks to do the right thing and to re reduce their own carbon footprints. I want to work with the county on that. I think county executive Precy has been really leading in this respect and the city is a little bit behind. Um, we need to make it easier for folks to make their homes energy efficient and to use renewable energy. The counties adopt PACE financing. We need to make sure that we can help businesses take advantage of that to reduce their carbon footprints. And we need a transit system that's low carbon. And we need to bring back uh, municipal compost collection because compost is, or food waste is one of the larger sources of methane in the landfill and that's a, a tremendous greenhouse gas. So just on down the list, there's a ton of things that we need to be doing and we literally have no time left. So we have to do them now. Mr. Mayor, you have 60 seconds. Well, I want to just mention two things before I directly answer your question. First, I don't have an interest in doing a duplicative program with the county. As we said earlier, we are part of the county. There is absolutely no reason that a Madison property shouldn't be entitled to the same benefits as somebody in Maple Bluff or Windsor or, or Roxbury. Secondly, I think we ought to be clear that if we're going to do things that are really going to reduce greenhouse gases and carbon footprints, what we have to do is be sensible. The expense and the carbon that's used in collecting individual household waste is enormous compared to putting that same work into going to large producers of food waste like restaurants and supermarkets. That's where we should be focused. But the really big difference is going to be partnering with Madison Gas and Electric because as long as they are burning coal, your electric car really is not that green. And that's the key. Thank you. Bill, uh, you have a, stay stand there, Mr. Mayor, because Bill has another question for you. What difference does it make to the city of Madison that Donald Trump is president? Something that doesn't get easier to say over time. <laughs> what can the city and its leaders do to push back against the threat that he poses? The uh, uh, Latino Chamber of Commerce dinner Saturday night uh, heard me read the portion of the letter I received from ICE after I had written them a letter regarding the September activities here and then met with them in uh, early December and made it very clear that we were exposing and we were demanding that they change their protocols and in fact without admitting they made a mistake in that letter in response uh, they acknowledged that they were wrong. Will that keep them out of the city and state? I don't know, but at least it was pushback. We pushed back in regards to uh, the, the Donald Trump, I don't want to say the president, uh, rejection of the Paris Accords in regards to climate change. Uh, Madison was one of the first of what is now 400, last time I said it was 300, 400 cities around the U.S who have, in effect, re-ratified on their own the Paris Accords. Then there are some really bad things that are being proposed, the worst of which is the addressing of a vital question in this country, which is infrastructure, sustainability, building transit systems, that sort of thing. The President of the United States is basically trying to build a system to turn all of this over to the private sector. And while we desperately need uh, improvements in everything that's sustainable, we cannot do it at the price of privatization. Thank you. You have 60 seconds to respond to yourself. Response to the Trump administration is fierce resistance. And it is up to cities. But you know what? It's been up to cities for a long time. 
um, because we've had gridlock at the federal level. Yes, he's awful. Yes, he's doing even worse things. Um, but we've had gridlock at the federal level for a while, and so cities have had to lead for a long time. Um, and cities are the level where things get done, right? It's the day-to-day -day that affects your life the most, and, and we are leading. Cities all across the country are leading, and Madison can lead uh, even more so, I think, in that context. But yeah, fierce resistance, the best we can do to work with, uh, t you know, Tammy, sorry, Senator Baldwin and, and Representative Pocan, um, to push back and get what we can, immigration, climate, LGBTQ rights, you know, just go down the list, right? We have to stand up for what's right. Our last question tonight is going to be posed by Judy Davidoff for Satya Rhodes Connolly. So in your introduction, you mentioned your collaborative leadership style. Would you please briefly describe how that works in practice and give an example of a time you feel you successfully brought a complex project from inception to completion? Sure. Um, I lead a team at the Mayor's Innovation Project of uh, six folks, eight if you count support staff. Um, and we collaborate on everything. Um, I'm sort of nominally in charge, but um, we decide together uh, how something is going to go forward, and we figure out who's going to implement what, and we move it forward. That's my leadership style. Um, I, so I do it at work. I did it on the council, um, and I will do it in the mayor's office. Let me give you one example from the council. Um, Sherman Avenue had plagued District 12 for over a decade. Um, high speeds, dangerous traffic, somebody actually died there, and there were numerous crashes. And city couldn't make the change that needed to be made. Nobody had the gumption to do it. And I worked with every neighborhood association, the planning council, the business association, although they weren't really interested in working with me, um, individual businesses, the uh, bike fed, um, traffic engineering, and the entire council um, to build a coalition, to find a solution, to get the data that we needed to show what the right solution was. Um, and we changed the configuration of Sherman Avenue with a 20 to 0 vote. It's been incredibly successful. It's a much safer corridor for everyone, pedestrians, bicyclists, and cars. Um, and I could not have done it by myself. I had to do it in collaboration. Mr. Mayor, if you'd like to say anything, you have 60 seconds. Well, I'll give two examples. One with the private sector, which was the exact sciences TIF. There we were faced in a dilemma of exact sciences either going to Fitchburg or here in Madison. We wanted them in Madison, but we wanted more. And we wanted them to be in that neighborhood, one of the lowest income census tracts in the city, and we wanted to attain a situation where they were going to be required to hire residents from the neighborhood. We brought together Exact Sciences and the Urban League into a training program, and we got the commitment to hire neighborhood residents, $15 an hour, a pension and health insurance. If you'll recall, in the 15 or so months leading up to August of 2017, there were 14 homicides in Madison involving young African Americans, most often as the assailant and the victim. We put together a program with a nonprofit, several nonprofits, the county and city staff, and in the following 15 months, we've reduced it to four homicides, and we're going to keep it down to where it's zero. Thank you. Big round of applause for our candidates tonight. Really appreciate it. Our time is short, so uh, why don't we just keep it down? Uh, can you can we do one minute closing remarks, starting with Mr. Mayor? You know I can't. Um, <laughs> as I started out in the introduction, and as we've gone through this conversation for the last hour, it's been very clear, I hope, that it's one thing to espouse progressive values. It's another thing, and it's another challenge to make them work, to make a city that functions to take ideas out of the abstract, 
to look at what's happening elsewhere where they're operating under different statutes, where they're operating under different mechanisms for financing government, and then bringing together the necessary people in a multitude of ways and making Madison the city that it is today, whether it is something like the State Street Mall, which has been described by one urban expert as the finest uh, street in, in the United States, or dealing with more complex health issues that, that we face. But I'm here with your support to continue finishing the job. Thank you. Ms. O'Connor, take your time. Uh, you have one to 90 seconds up here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks to uh, our fearless host and to the panel and to everybody who made this possible. And thanks to all of you for being here tonight. I appreciate your dedication to your city government. And uh, we talked a lot about the challenges that Madison is facing tonight. These challenges aren't unique and they're not unsolvable. Together, we can make progress on them. We have so many assets in this city. What we need is experience from right here in this community and from across the country, vision of what's possible, the political courage to push back and push through and get things done, and the collaborative leadership style to work with whoever it takes to do what's right for this city. I will bring that leadership, I will bring that vision, that experience, and that leadership style to the city of Madison. If you want to learn more about me, please visit satyaformadison.com. That's S-A-T-Y-A for Madison.com. And I hope that in the course of the evening that I've earned your vote. Don't forget, you can vote early at any of our fine public libraries or, of course, at your polling place on April 2nd. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Well, let's, keep the, let's keep the applause going for our panelists, Molly Stanks, Bill Leaders. Judy Davidoff. We'd like to thank our team at Downtown Madison Incorporated, Jason Ilstrup, John uh, Signal, uh, John, you know who you are, sorry, <laughs> Madeline Plummer, Eli Judge, and the fine folks from Capital Neighborhoods Incorporated, Norman Stockwell, uh, and Downtown Alder, Mike Verveer. Our video stream was provided by Natalie Hinckley and her team from Hinckley Productions. Thank you to my colleagues at Isthmus, Joe Tarr, Jerry Casper. Chelsea DeCane, Linda Falkenstein, Catherine Capolero, David Michael Miller, Bob Coe, Craig Bartlett, and Jeff Haupt. A big kudos to Aaron Scholes, Super Dave Lorenzen, Will Keneally, Nina Kervinsky, Stuart Levertan, and Sholly Pittman from Community Powered Radio, uh, WRT 89.9 FM. And a very, very special thank you to Tom Carls and Greg Michaels and all the staff from the Madison Public Library and our audience here tonight. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dylan, and for more information on basically everything, please consult your local librarian. Good night, and go vote.